Hey everyone, welcome back to Signal Processing with Paul. In this video, what we're going to do is continue our exploration of complex numbers and hopefully give you a deeper understanding and appreciation for how cool complex numbers are and how to manipulate them. So to get started, one thing I want to think about is the fact that if I have a number line, and this is the plus and minus direction, if I have a number like let's say two, I can think of this as just two places in the positive direction, or I can think about this as a vector starting at where zero is and pointing two units to the right. And as a result, here's number two. If I consider the negative of this, negative two, I can think of this as two in the minus direction, a vector that goes from zero to the left. Or I can think of this as taking our vector that went from zero to two and rotating it 180 degrees so that it faces the minus direction. So multiplying this number two by minus one actually does a rotation of 180 degrees. And if you think a moment about the fact that j equals the square root of minus one, or j squared is minus one, we can ask, where would a 90 degree rotation, what would it look like? Now, if your thought was 90 degrees, you would be correct in the j direction. So this is what j allows us to do. Rather than 180 degrees, multiplying by j will take me from two in the positive direction to the right to two up. Now I have this point here, this is two j. I multiply by j again, so times j, I now get two j squared, which gives me minus two. So this is another 90 degree rotation, giving me 180 degrees multiply by j a third time, times j, and I will get this point down here, which is minus 2j, and multiply by j again. This is 4 times 90 degrees, which gets me 360 degrees. This gets, this gets me back where I started, but it does this because what I get is minus 2j squared minus times j squared, which is another minus, gives me a positive 2. So if you think about multiplying by minus 1 being a 180 degree rotation, think about multiplying by j as a 90 degree rotation. Now that's great, but how does this help us with complex numbers? Well, this helps because not every rotation is just going to be 90 degrees. Sometimes what you're going to have are rotations that are some particular degrees that, you know, maybe somewhere between 0 and 360. So, one of the things we can do, if I bring my, oops, if I bring my imaginary axis back, is I can draw a circle. And what I'm going to do with this circle is I'm going to give this circle a certain radius, r, and I'm also going to give it a certain angle, theta, from the positive axis. So if you think about me taking a vector and then rotating it at an angle, theta, this is just a rotation that gets me to where my vector r is pointing out at the circle to some specific point. And if we want to, let's say, find the sides of this triangle, we can do this pretty easily. So let me define A as this part, and let me define B as this part. Now, how can we find them given this point? Well, using trigonometry, we know that the cosine of theta is going to be the adjacent over the hypotenuse. So this is going to equal a over r. And as a result, a is going to equal r cosine of theta this point. And if we look at the, b, the vector b, what we can think of is b. We look at the sine of the angle theta, and what I get here is b over r, and as a result, b is going to equal r sine of theta. So this point here is going to be equal to r cosine of theta plus, now I need to go in the j direction, j times r sine of theta and looking at Euler's expression, we can just see this by multiplying through by r. This gets me to the point r e to the j theta, where j is my angle of rotation. 
So this is great. This helps explain how we get this get these components. But one of the things I want to do is take this a little bit further. So we have our e to the j theta. And another thing we can do is we can look at the complex conjugate of this number. That's going to get this point down here. That's going to be r e to the minus j theta. Because remember, the complex conjugate is just flipping the sign, which then, of course, makes me go in the negative angle. So rather than going in angle theta in the basically the counterclockwise direction, which we consider to be the sort of positive theta direction, we're now rotating a, an angle of minus theta down here. And given these two points, we can actually solve for a, which equals our cosine of theta, by basically adding these two together, which if I did this, it would be all the way to here and all the way to here. And this, adding these two together, that'd be this vector here, and then dividing by two because I'm trying to find this length, not twice this length. So let's go ahead and write this out. What we want to say, A equals R cosine of theta, and this equals R e to the j theta plus R e to the minus j theta divided by two. And dividing through by r, we get cosine of theta equals e to the j theta plus e to the minus j theta divided by 2. This is a good expression to remember, and we'll come back to it later. Let's do the same thing in the other direction, except this time, let's look at this point over here. Now, what am I doing here? I'm going to go minus r, and what I'm going to go is e to the minus j theta, which means I'm going to go r units here, I'm going to look at this vector, then I'm going to take this vector and rotate it minus theta, which will take me in the clockwise direction up to this particular point. And if I look at what's going on here, what I've done here is I've basically built this vector also being b. And if I add this part and this part, what I get is r e to the j theta minus r e to the minus j theta is going to equal this distance b. But another way we can look at this distance b is j r sine of theta. And I'm saying j here because we are going in the j direction. So dividing through by jr, and this is actually over 2 because I added it twice, this is b and this is b, what I get here is that sine of theta is equal to e to the j theta minus e to the minus j theta all the way divided by 2j. Kind of interesting. Once again, We'll come back to this. So this is one of the ways you can see the expressions here on the circle or the, maybe the unit circle, though it doesn't have to be the unit circle, and how they relate to Euler's expression. This really tells me the real direction, and this really tells me the imaginary direction times j that gets me to this number here that tells me the rotation, and then here is basically the implicit radius. All fine and dandy. But there's yet another reason Euler's expression is really important. So if you remember, we can write the Taylor series expansion of e to the x as equal to the sum from n equals 0 to infinity of x to the n over n factorial, which equals, and I'll just write out the first few terms, 1 plus x over 1 factorial plus x squared over 2 factorial plus x to the third over 3 factorial plus x to the fourth over 4 factorial. And I'll write out the fifth term, x to the fifth over 5 factorial, like so. Now let's look at the Taylor series expansions of sine and cosine. Sine of x has a Taylor series expansion that's equal to x minus x to the third over 3 factorial plus x to the fifth over 5 factorial 
minus x to the seventh over seven factorial, and so on and so forth. If we look at cosine of x, what we get is one minus x squared over two factorial plus x to the fourth over four factorial minus x to the sixth over six factorial, and so on and so forth. And if you look at these terms, there are two things to notice. First thing is notice how these have alternating signs. That's kind of interesting. All of these here are positive, but these guys have alternating signs. So do we have in the cosine. The other thing to notice is that cosine has all the even terms. Sine has all the odd terms. Another thing to remember, cosine is an even function, whereas sine is an odd function, meaning that uh, basically f of x equals minus f of minus x, that's an odd function, and f of minus x equals f of x, that's an even function. So cosine has all the even terms, it's an even function. Sine has all the odd terms, and it's an odd function. Hmm. If you start looking at this enough, and maybe you go back up to Euler's expression, and huh, seems to be an answer here. What if I take e to the x, and rather than x, I replace in j times x? So what I'm going to do is write e to the j x, and rather than write out this whole thing, what I'm going to do is write out each term. I'm going to get 1 plus j x over 1 factorial. Now I'm going to get plus j squared x squared over 2 factorial, but we can just write this as minus 2, or sorry, minus x squared over 2 factorial. Now we're going to get x to the third, but we can take out a j squared to make a minus 1, so we're going to get minus j x to the third over 3 factorial. We're going to get plus j to the fourth x to the fourth, but j to the fourth is just one, so we're going to get plus x to the fourth over four factorial. And then x to the fifth, what's going to get, we're going to come out of this is a j, so we're going to get plus j x to the fifth over five factorial. So now what we're getting is something interesting. We're getting plus plus minus minus plus plus. And if you look at this, what you'll see here is all of the even terms match what we have with cosine. And all of the odd terms match what we have with sine, except there's a j in front of them. As a result, if you, you know, look at this hard enough and long enough, it's very clear to see that e to the jx is equal to cosine of x plus, here is that j that we need to divide through by, j sine of x. This is what gives us Euler's formula, both geometrically and in terms of our series. Anyway, hope you found this helpful, and thanks for watching.